So the next speaker is uh, Teresa Tobel from the Hasso Plattner Institute at the University of Potsdam in Germany. Uh, she will give the talk entitled uh, Towards Personalized Dialogue-Based System Supported Learning for Books. Uh, so, Teresa, when you are ready, you can start, please. Yeah, I'm going to share. Um, so yeah, my name is Teresa Sobel. I'm, I'm currently a PhD student at the Hato Platner Institute, and I'm going to talk about personalized dialogue-based systems supported learning for MOOCs. As most of us know, since one and a half years, we are in um, home office, distance learning, e-learning, whatever online variation we have right now, it's, um, it's stressful and we all got to know it. And we can also see it in, in terms of numbers that 97% uh, of all students that are were enrolled in a bachelor that was a bachelor in person shifted to online education. And this number can also be reflected in, in terms of MOOC numbers, where we have more than 60% growth um, for learners on the platform Coursera, um, which means more than 200% growth of the enrollments. Um, and edX even counted 110 million enrollments. Um, that is, of course, a number that is pretty high and, and reflects the pandemic. But as we can see here on, on the scale from, from edX, it, it's growing steadily and um, the pandemic helped the evaluation, but in, in, in general, um, online and e-learning gets more and more popular. And there are, of course, several factors that, um, that, that verify this statement. Um, the one point is that it's very flexible. You can do online learning and distance learning from wherever you are right now at any time, mostly at hardly any costs, meaning that most of the MOOC courses or online courses are free to use if you're not um, wanting a specific certificate or specific grade, but also you don't have to travel anywhere. You don't need um, a hotel or, or a place to live. You can just do it from home. Um, Additionally, the effort is also um, pretty and uh, pretty low in, in means of that you just need a laptop or a tablet and a stable internet connection. Um, and then you can learn at your own pace. Mostly there is a specific time span when you do you can do the learning or the reading or the exercise. Um, um, another big benefit of distance learning is the better and more efficient information exchange between students. So this is also in connect, um, connected with the flexibility around the world. So now you're not only connected with the people in your area, for example, my area, Berlin, but I'm also connected with people all around the world, which also greatens my network um, for research and interests. However, if we have a look at this um, second picture, we see that um, from these 97%, 63 or more and a half people said that they're are not very satisfied with the situation of, of online learning um, in comparison to classroom style learning. And um, that was really a thing that uh, wanted to know why this, this happened because many people are frustrated and feel less motivated. Um, and I found this very interesting paper um, from Wong. It's from 2007, but I think it's still very um, valid and up to date where it's a critical literature review on e-learning limitations. And she um, proposed five categories where these limitations are um, put to. Um, so first of all, there are the technological limitations, meaning weak hardware. So an old laptop, an old smartphone. And uh, in addition to that, a poor internet connection. Um, even though here in Germany, we have mostly pretty good internet, I think most of us who are who have been to Germany know that, for example, on trains, but in rural areas, on mountains, the internet connection is really, really bad. And in, in poorer countries or less developed countries, this is even a, um, a worse, the case is even worse. Um, the second part um, is are the personal limitations. They mostly refer to the new skills that we need to have to, to work with the te technology the online technology. Um, of course, for young people that 
work with smartphones and laptops all days, something like Zoom or Big Blue Button or Skype is, is, is quite easy to use. But um, if you say the older generations, it's for them harder and harder to learn new skills and get to know this technology. Um, then, of course, um, there's the lack of self-discipline and self-motivation. I think we all had this during the pandemic. Um, it's hard to get up, to go, to, to take a shower, to even go to, to, to your desk. Um, many students reported that they just lay in bed during their classrooms and they really feel frustrated and don't have the motivation to, to do more. Um, and an additional factor is the language barrier. Um, of course, MOOC plat or MOOC courses are offered to anyone who is um, who has an internet connection around the world. But most courses or many courses are in English, and it gets really hard that people um, communicate or or uh, mention what's wrong or what their problem is, and really get the support they need. Um, then there is some limitations compared to traditional learning, mostly the absence of physical interaction, emotions and body languages. Again, I think we can all relate to that. Now we are sitting here in, in like I'm sitting in front of my computer and I don't see anyone. And it's kind of like in normally that would have been a bigger presentation in front of you all. And you don't see any emotions, any body language. And that kind of feels a bit frustrating or a bit, it, it stresses people out. Um, Additionally, seeking advice gets more and more harder. Normally, students would go to, to the professor after the lecture or during office hours and, and contact him um, with the problem directly. But now it's everything is online. People um, or students have to message the professor via email. And this, this is really, um, for some people, writing emails is next level. They don't want to do it. They, um, they feel pressured by it and for them it gets really hard. And the third point is the lack of university facilities, meaning library and, and career counseling mostly. And um, in terms of library, this is not only the, the exchange or the, the, the renting of books, but it's also the, the, the groups, the social interaction you have at the library where we exchange information, exchange knowledge. And um, the second point, uh, career counseling, it's, it's really important for people to know what to do next, which courses to take next. And mostly this is left out when doing online work. Um, design limitations are referred to poorly designed slides, courses, um, material. Um, this is, yeah, mostly because people might not know what's out there, what, what is there to use. It's not only slides and presentations, there are also interactive boards, but you have to know them, again, how to use them, similar to the personal limitation I just managed. You need to have the skills to use this. So often it's just poor design of, of the knowledge that should be transferred. Last but not least, then, there's the constant availability. And I think we all can again refer to that, that we have our phone, our watches, everything is now connected. And if you don't really force yourself to switch off, you're constantly available. There is no time when you really say, okay, now I finished working and I really switch off everything. That's really not the case with online learning. So, I had a closer look at these factors and I, I, I found some of them which I think that really can be tackled, really can be solved on the platform side. Of course, the weak hardware, poor internet connection, that's something that's on my personal side. Um, I, can, I can reduce the, the payload a website has, but in the end, it really has to, I really have to have a device or a connection to connect to the MOOC platform. But something like, like skills that are needed or the lack of self-discipline, a language barrier problem, that's something um, I thought that the platform can counter it. So I came up with a general concept where I thought, okay, um, there should be an automated dialogue-based system, meaning a chatbot for MOOC platforms that's not only an alternative source of customer service, but also provides the students and instructors with a variety of automated scaffolding tools. And the big goal should be that people, um, that, that the um, learning experience is improved, 
the motivation is improved, that the dropout rate is decreased, and most of all, that people are encouraged to continue learning and they like to learn and take more courses on the platform. Before I go into detail what scaffolding tools this, this chatbot should have, I, I did a um, bit related research, um, a search for related research and um, for chatbots in education, and there are quite a lot out there. Some chatbots help with language learning. Um, for example, also Duolingo is something quite similar where people learn with the help of a chatbot. Um, the chatbots that monitor students in the e-learning activities, find potential issues, and then try to counteract, try to help them with specific material. Um, of course, there's customer support chatbots for universities and MOOC platforms. Um, um, at a, Quite famous example is the T and Q bot, where the T bot is the tutor or the bot for the tutor and supports the instructors with teach in in their teaching activities, and the Q bot supports the student in the ed educational activities. Um, MOOC Buddy is another example where um, in a personal learning is encouraged with the help of recommendations and your social media profile. So the interests that are um, that are in your social media profile and your activities help offering recommendations in terms of, of, of learning, learning material. Last but not least, there is the quiz bot. I thought that's quite interesting. I should, would have definitely used it during my university career. Um, it helps students to learn the faculty knowledge with flashcards and with the help of the chatbot. Um, that's, I think, a quite good idea for a chatbot. So now let's uh, let me introduce the, the different scaffolding tools that um, I came up with. Most of them or some of them are related to the related book I just mentioned. And it's more like a collection of many ideas that should be in or should that chatbot provide. Um, first of all, um, similar to the to the um, what is the name? MOOC buddy. Um, recommendations and learning paths should be given to the students. Um, this is um, this should counteract the personal limitation. Or, um, no, it should counteract mostly the limitation for from traditional learning, where the career consulting is missing and people or students don't really know what to do next and and what courses to take next and. These recommendations are based on the courses a user has already taken or, or mixed with um, other users' courses that they have taken and they have similar interests with. And of course, there's always the case, what, are, what, what's the, um, what is with users that um, don't have much activity on the platform but want to know where to go and, and which courses to take. So um, the chatbot will ask this, these users um, some multiple choice questions in a dialogue format and tries to get as many information about the user as possible. Um, and based on these answers, he can, or the chatbot tries to give um, as accurate recommendations and learning paths. Of course, these recommendations only work with the help of user feedback. So it's very important that a user um, rates the courses that are recommended. Here we have a small snippet of a conversation where the user um, states that his course or the course he took um, ended and he wants to improve his skills. And first of all, the chatbot um, asks again what course he meant and um, then he recommends some of these courses and even asks the user to if he wants to get enrolled to that course. Um, yeah. The next feature um, is the library tool, which is also um, related to the absence of the absence of, of um, university faculties uh, um, facilities like the library. And as I mentioned before, it's it's not just the the getting getting the books and leaving the library. It's more about the social interactions you have at the library, the exchange of knowledge and information you have there with other students. So, of course, there should be a search engine to find current and interesting research, scientific papers, maybe um, events in your area and or um, interesting talks online or in person. 
but it should also um, encourage people of exchanging interesting articles and papers themselves. So it's not only the chatbot that finds these um, uh, finds this, these resources, but it's also the students and instructors that recommend papers. And this rec these recommendations should then, um, in the long run, lead to specialized discussion groups where people really interact with each other over specific topic, specific research, or specific talk where they went to or heard together. And um, in the end, this should promote social interaction and, and uh, promote the transfer of information and knowledge. Um, a personal limitation I mentioned before is the self-discipline or the lack of self-discipline. And um, this leads to, uh, this is mostly because of an inefficient management of study time. And to counteract this problem, um, I got the idea of having a really simple to-do list and a reminder included in the chatbot, where, as we can see here, I can ask for my to-do list and I get the next courses and exercises and um, quizzes that need or will be added. Uh, will be, um, sorry, I just need to take it. That are coming up. So um, the, the, uh, the to-do list is integrated with a reminder function. So for example, this, this um, course exercise three should be, um, the, the user would have been reminded via email or via notification in the course itself, if he wanted that. Um, this should help with a better self-organization and also um, reduce the stress and frustration. Um, I thought it could also be um, that the, chatbot automatically adds all the, all the due dates from a course. So for example, if there's an exercise coming up, it's automatically added to the to-do list. And that's a function that can be switched off and switched on again. Um, the next scaffolding tool included into the chatbot should, um, is a quiz. Similar to the quiz bot I mentioned in the related book, um, here the quiz should encounter the problem of the lack of self-discipline and lack of self-motivation. And quizzes in general encourage students and support the learning. So this is a really good idea to add a quiz to, to a chatbot where you, the user can practice with the chatbot. And in the course of learning, he can request tips and recommendations for further explanations. The difficulty level can be set automatically or manually, depending either on the learning progress or the user sets, his, sets it himself. Um, of course, I said beforehand that um, it should not really be a customer support chat, but, but um, FAQs are really important for users that they don't have to wait very long for a rather simple question. And on the other hand, um, for the platform provider, manual support is mostly costly. So um, FAQs are included in the chatbot where the user can ask about the platform itself, the pricing of courses, um, the certificates, the course structure, but also about the private data privacy and age restrictions. Um, there are going to be a more Personalized FAQs, for example, questions um, that relate to the user's courses itself. So how long is the course? Um, where can I download my certificate? Or when is going to be the next exercise? And this is, of course, related to the recommendations um, section where the user can also ask, I have my, finished my course. Can you recommend me a next course? Um, yeah, here's an example conversation where um, the user asks about um, how to, to enroll or enter a course, and he gets a quick um, explanation what steps he needs to do next and even get, um, could ask for more explanation if needed. Um, one thing that I thought is really, really important is the speech support. Um, to encounter the problems of language barrier, but also a little bit the technological limitations in means of small screen devices. Um, so you can directly dictate commands and messages to the chatbot, 
which helps getting better and more efficient support and betters the learning experience in general. Last but not least, um, the chatbot offers tutorials to um, encounter the limitations of um, the new skills that people need to, to use the technology. Um, these tutorials don't have to be on the platform itself. They can be from, from any source in, in written or in, in, text, uh, in text form or in video form and um, should show a guidance in, uh, in the digital environment. This can also be in form of, of a how-to guide or some websites offers this visual guidance when they first enter a website and you see visual elements popping up. Um, this should support then students and instructors. Um, concerning the, the implementations, uh, the implementation, a chatbot should of course be calm and friendly during a conversation and he should not come across boring more, he should come across as a buddy or a tutor which you like to talk to and, and like to talk more often to and to not have any biases or discrimination. The chatbot itself is gender neutral and has a gender neutral appearance. In means of technical implementation, um, as already mentioned, there should be a speech support and text support, but to, um, yeah, to, to, um, to improve the text-based conversation, there should also be buttons. For example, like you see in the, in the um, screenshot, there is yes, no, and I don't understand, but this can also be um, more advanced text snippets. For example, if the user asks for um, which course the user, um, if the chatbot asks which course the user meant, there will be the last two courses um, the user just used. And last but not least, there is um, the self-learning ability of the chatbot, meaning that the domains need to be continuously improved and with the help, of course, of the, the, um, the feedback of the users, um, with also a little bit of tracking, not the IPs or the names, but mostly the what was the question, what was the answer. And that's a bit of manual work that needs to be done to have the perfect conversation. But I think everyone who once built a chatbot knows that, that process to improve a chatbot. Um, to sum it up, there are many limitations in distance learning um, that lead to dissatisfaction, stress, and frustration. And I came up with a concept for an automated personalized dialogue-based system for MOOC platforms. Um, and this has some scaffolding tools that reduce the limitations and support learners in their learning activities. And in the end, this should create a more personalized learning experience, reduce the dropout rate, and above all, encourage, encourage continuous learning. Here are some of my sources, but you can find out, so this is mostly the related work. Um, you can find all of them in my paper. And thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm happy to hear questions or answer questions. Okay, thank you very much, Teresa, for this very interesting presentation. I think we all are very interested in these kind of systems about conversational agents and dialogue-based systems. So now we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions. Um, I don't see questions here in the Q&A box, but in the meantime, they will receive questions. I have, I have one question, a couple of them, actually. Um, actually, uh, you are... You mentioned that the, the goal of your research, your research is uh, to improve the learning experience in terms of uh, motivation, satisfaction, and also that uh, you would like to overcome somehow the limitations of the distance learning. Uh, for example, the, the lack of physical presence, uh, the emotions, body language, and so on. Okay, you you know that there is a, a broad field here about emotional learning. Um, how do you, your system deals with emotional learning? Do you, do you provide some, uh, some uh, inputs or some, uh, some uh, information to the system in terms of what 
the what the, the emotional or the affective uh, state is of the student. Uh, do you collect this information about the emotions? Um, I, I thought about it while writing the paper, but um, as this is a really big field, yeah. Yeah. in addition to 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 encounter all the limitations, I thought about doing it, and I think if um, the system is coming into into reality, of course there should be an emotional um, factor or emo the emotions of the students are going to be respected and, and included. But for now, I am mostly focused on, on the things that, that can be offered directly. And then in the next step, there's going to be the, the what's, what's inside the chatbot. I, I agree, this is uh, complicated, but it's a very interesting path yeah. to explore because emotional, emotions from distance learning are really important, like in face-to-face, -face, but is the, they are very difficult, more difficult to, uh, to catch, no? to, to understand. And yeah, I agree. Your step is about how to, uh, how to detect the, the emotional state in order to design the suitable, uh, effective feedback so that to, you know, to correct some uh, negative emotion into positive, you know? Very complicated, yeah. quite interesting to explore. So, uh, <laughs> well, just the last question I have. Eh? Maybe we can do that in one minute. Uh, no, because I'm interested in the in the part that you mentioned that this, your system can self-learn from the user feedback. Okay, that is very interesting. Uh, but I wonder, um, how do you do that? I mean, it is a manual process. It, yeah. it is by um, experts in the in each and every domain of the of the system, and, and I wonder what it is feasible, no? Um, <laughs> so so the, the process itself it is yeah. called self learning, but as you mentioned, it's it's not really self learning. The the, the chatbot can, of course. Um, from rating C, if, if a conversation is, is good or bad. And also from if, um, if an answer is also always marked as bad, it kind of like, um, you can kind of like set a level of, of good or bad question, uh, good or bad answers. But mostly this, this means manual work in the end. It is process is just called self-learning, um, but in the end, there's always a human part with um, deleting bad data, adding new data to the chatbot. It's just that the chatbot can at one point kind of like realize that something is missing. If a question is often marked as um, it's, it's the wrong answer or an answer is missing here or this and that feature is missing, this information can be given to me and then I have to, to add this to the, the chatbot. I see. Okay. Since uh, there are no more questions from the audience, so we can stop here and move on to the next uh, the next uh, speaker. So thank you very much, Teresa, thank for you. the interesting presentation.